But um, like she said, Sister Catherine is much better place. Uh, I didn't tell her, but I always say, you know, we're going to have mansions. The Bible says that the Lord went to build mansions for each and every one of us. And I wanted to tell her, you know, just keep the kids from touching the windows and all that. <laughs> If there's any grass, make sure people take care of that until I, I get up there. She told me, um, yeah, we're, you're going to come to my home. When I, she said, when I get home, or she was in the house, she said, we're going to cook you a dinner, and you and your family are coming over to eat in my home. And uh, she left to the home of homes. And... Uh, even though we're going to hold that to her. Amen. So we look forward to that. Amen. Um, let's go ahead and, and uh, get into the word of God. Praise the Lord. There's a whole lot of scriptures here. I know that uh, after a few minutes, some of you are going to say, well, I got to do laundry, Pastor Martin. I got to go home and cook. So I'm going to try to be as uh, brief as possible. Uh, praise the Lord. Let's go ahead and open up to the book of Matthew, please, chapter 10. Um, I'm just searching for the scripture. I just want to say that John the Baptist, as a servant of the Lord, he suffered. Poor, he suffered. Stephen, he suffered. Jesus himself suffered. Others suffered because of his word. Jesus suffered because he was the word. And he still is. Sister Catherine suffered in her physical body. But she didn't give in to it. She stayed strong, she stayed the course, and even in the conditions that she found herself in, she didn't stop depositing in others the love and the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so you have to admire that. That no matter what we face, Two things are certain. Heaven will still be heaven. And God, well, he'll always be God. And he remains in control. And just because we go through some stuff doesn't mean that God has at any moment lost any power. He's omniscient, omnipotent, and omnipresent. He can't find another place to hide because he's already everywhere. He can't gain any more power because he's already all powerful. And there's nothing new for him to learn because he's already omniscient. He knows everything. He can do anything and he can be anywhere. Amen? Matthew's chapter 10. Now, there's several verses here. I'm going to include some of you guys. That's, we're, we're family, so I'm going to say, you know, I'm going to give you some verses. Somebody look it up. Uh, here, let's start with this one. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1. I need somebody going to say, I'll read that later on when I, when I ask you to, okay? Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1. Not everybody at the same time, please. <laughs> you will? Thank you, six schools. So... It'll be Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1. Um, Daniel's chapter 12, verse 13. And you know around here. If you don't help me, we're going to be here a long time. <laughs> Brother Randy's chapter 12, Daniel's, um, verse 13, all right? Acts chapter 7. Acts chapter 7. 
You got it? Okay, chapter 7, verse 54, 55, 56, all right? I mean, I got one more here. We're going to get through this. Believe me, we're going to get through this. Philippians chapter 3. Sister Jen? Verse 13 and 14, Philippians chapter 3. And that's it. I got the rest. Thank you for participating. The Lord is going to bless you. All right, Matthew chapter 10, verse 22. Matthew chapter 10, verse 22. The Bible reads as follows, in the name of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost, and the church says, Amen. Amen. And you will be hated by all for my name's sake, but he who endures to the end will be saved. He who endures to the end will be be saved. I want to talk to you for just a few minutes um, on the title, I will see you at the finish line. I will see you at the finish line. Father, we come before your presence, having already worshipped and praised you this morning, we know that you are in the midst. For the Bible said you inhabit the praises of your people. And so we need you. We need your covering. We need your anointing. We need your sovereign intelligence and wisdom so that you can allow me, dear God, in the name of Jesus Christ, to be the instrument this morning to share your word. Speak to my heart first. Speak through me and then to the congregation, Lord. You know, every person that's here, you know their hearts, you know their needs, their wants, their desires, you know the circumstances, you know the situation, you know everything, Lord. We could never surprise you with a prayer because you already know everything. And I ask thee, God, that while you're in the midst and while you're honoring us in your presence, would you just go ahead and go through every pew, every seat, dear Lord, and search the heart, meet the needs, dear God. Give them the breakthrough and the victory that they're praying for. You know all things. We ask you, dear God, in the name of Jesus Christ, that your word would touch us and minister to us and lift us up to another level of hope, dear Lord, when we leave here this afternoon. God, we love you and we praise you in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen and amen. Praise the Lord. Imagine yourself in a relay race, if you will. Um, maybe when you were back in school, uh, maybe if you went through some sort of an academy, like uh, Brother Chris and myself. Um, I, I don't know, maybe you hold relay races in your living room every day. I, I don't know. But... I don't know how everybody lives here, but just imagine yourself in a relay race. You're part of a team. And you're going through all these events. You're, you're going through the mud. Uh, you're riding bike for, for miles. You're uh, swimming over uh, across a lake. Um, you're low crawling on the barbed wire, army style. Okay? Today is army style. I know there may be some Marines and Navy guys and women and, and Air Force and maybe Coast Guards. But I'm Army, so today it's Army. <laughs> if you want to know how the Marines and every other armed forces do it, then next week we'll do the Marine. The other week we'll do Navy and so on and so on, okay? So we don't leave anybody out. But today it's Army. And so you find yourself low crawling, going through muds and climbing up hills and running down hills. You're in a relay race. And through every event you go through, you can sense the finish line closer and closer as you jump from one event to the other. And so naturally, as a team, you're going to press on towards that finish line because you want to finish it. You want to get across this finish line. And once you... Get across this finish line. In fact, before you even cross it, but as soon as you see it, inside of you, you start feeling this level of joy or elation that starts building up inside of you. That gives you the strength to go ahead and, and, and make it all the way across that finish line. And once you cross that finish line, 
those on your team that have already crossed it and, and, and they're already there, they catch their breath, they gather themselves, and when they look at each other, they hug each other, they high-five each other, they, 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 they're full of joy, they, they congratulate each other, and they, they honor each other for having accomplished such a strong and, and uh, competitive race. And then you, 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 you look towards the line and, and, you, and you're scanning and you're scanning, waiting to see your other fellow uh, athlete that trained with you, that fought with you and prepared with you so that when they come in, you give them that hug, you give them that welcome, that congratulations, you lift them up in joy, you, 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 you sing, you dance, you jump up, you've accomplished it. And aside from them, there'll be other family members, think spiritually now, there'll be other family members already there at the finish line waiting for you to cross it, waiting to embrace you. Waiting to welcome you on that side of the line. Waiting to congratulate you. And to tell you well done. They don't care if you came in first place, last place. They don't care if you stumbled throughout the course. They just are so excited and happy that you made it across that line. And you finished the course. Who has acts? All right, you got to be on point now. You got to be on point. Keep your finger on that scripture. Slam the Bible on your pinky there. And believe me, you'll remember you got to read something. Mama. line by your friends your athletic friends or your friends or your family members and your loved ones but you're also going to have their Jesus Christ the thing that hit me about these verses is that he was standing and it's probably according to my knowledge the only time they talk about the throne Jesus sitting down to talk about the throne, Jesus being on the side of it, being on the right hand of the Father. But this is the only time I've read where it says that he was standing. All right, now let's switch channels here. Baseball players. Anybody? Baseball lovers? Baseball. Two people? <laughs> so, the World Series, seven games. The series is tied. Three to three. This is the last game. Your team is up, they're batting, you're in the stands, of course. One of the guys gets a hit. And while you're sitting, yeah, yeah, all right, you know. If they get to second, I think your roar becomes even a little louder. Yes, a double, yes, he's in scoring position. If they get to third, oh, you put your pool aside. Yeah. <laughs> but if they round third base, I seriously doubt that you'll be sitting down. Because <laughs> when they round third base, they're heading for home. And you'll be standing. You'll be giving them an ovation, a standing ovation, as they score across home base. 
Jesus saw Stephen being stoned because he spoke the truth. Because he told them how it was. Because he was bold in the word. If you're going to be bold in the word, you're going to sit in that saddle and you're going to get ready to ride because people are going to oppose you. And they'll oppose to you. They didn't want to hear what he was saying. Ah, you heard it. You read it. And he said to them all the truth. And they all together came and they started stoning him. And it says that he looked up while being stoned now. And he looked up and he saw Jesus, the son of the living God, not sitting, but standing. And when we stand in the baseball game, we don't just stand and watch people score. We're cheering them on as they're running around third and heading home. We're cheering them on. And I believe that was Jesus' intentions here. He was telling Stephen, just like he told Catherine, hold on, you're almost home. You're almost going to cross this line. Don't give up now. Push forward. Stay the course. Stay focused. Keep your eyes on Jesus. Keep your eyes on me in that point. And Stephen said, the Bible says that he saw him standing. And Jesus, no doubt, welcomed him home. Not sitting, but standing. And I said, and I, and I be honest, the Bible don't say this, but I know Jesus had to be saying some stuff. <laughs> he wasn't just looking at him, watching him get stoned. In fact, before he left, he said to the Lord, don't hold this against them. If you read that scripture, to being stoned, he said, don't hold this against them. And I don't know when we're going to be here again. You guys don't know if you're going to be here again. Tomorrow's not promised to anybody. But I know one thing for sure. That if we stay the course, just like Sister Catherine, if we stay focused, if we lock in on Jesus no matter what's going on in our sides or in our lives, we too are going to cross that line. And I will see every one of us there again if we don't see ourselves here in another occasion. Are you hear what I'm saying? Many times, people or different people, different folks, different strokes is what they say, right? And so... In crossing this finish line, after having finished such a tough course, people react differently. Some fall to the ground from all the exhaustion. Others just break down emotionally and cry. But when you cross that heavenly line, there'll be no more crying. There'll be emotions, because the Bible says we're going to be filled, filled with joy and happiness and in the Holy Ghost. So there'll be emotions. Remember, our spirit and soul is up there in the souls where it contains all the emotions. But there will be no crying out there. And some of them just break down and some of them just gather themselves after having run such a race. They catch their breath and then they start looking for family members and for friends. And I believe that among Stephen and among Jesus and among John the Baptist and among Paul and among others there's going to be one that we all know and she's going to be looking for Kathy and she's going to be looking for Chris and she's probably going to be like this like she stands there and she'll be like this I don't know if anybody's seen her doing that but she'll stand right there and that's what she does to herself but in her mind this time, she's going to be saying, I, I know they'll be here because they'll tell me, they told me they will be here. 
Chris told me he would make it here today. And she will be looking for them. As well as the rest of the TCC family. So don't you think for a moment that once she crossed that line, that you will not be noticed. You will be. Now, in that book of Acts that we've read, to be stoned and still stay focused tells us that we can stay focused no matter what life circumstances comes at us. Some go through tougher times than others. But if we know enough of the Lord, and I'm not saying I know everything, but you got to know something and hold on to something. He can't be your anchor if you have nothing, if you know nothing about him. He's our anchor. He holds us down in the midst of the storms. He keeps us together while everybody else is flipping out. He keeps us in place while everybody else is leaving our sides. Are you hearing what I'm saying? This is Jesus Christ. He promised he would help us. He promised to go build a house for us. He said, let not your heart be troubled. If you believe in God, believe also in me. For in my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I'm not going to make a fib, but I'm telling you, in my Father's house there are many mansions. And he goes, and I go to prepare a place for you and you and you and you. And then the word comes in where it changes everything. It says, and if, and I said, wait a minute, you just said you were going to go and build a mansion for me. Then it continues to go, and if I go and prepare. So I was stuck there for a few. I said, I don't understand that, Lord. First you're saying you're going to do it. Now you say, and if, that if, two-letter word is big. Because it means, and if I go and prepare a place for you. In other words, if you stay the course, if you finish this race, then you can look forward to that mansion. But many start the race, and they don't finish it. Someone else gets that mansion. But if Jesus says that he's building a mansion for us, he's telling us, he's reaffirming that there is eternal life after we leave here. And it'd be much better than the life we're living now. And I don't know about you, but that's what keeps me pushing forward towards the finish line. Well, I'll tell you, in this past month and a half, Ayana was sick. Then Sarah was sick. I had the flu. Before that, or in between that, our washer broke down. Our dryer broke down. Our furnace had to be worked on. And now, just two days ago, right, the freezer is acting up. My daughter woke me up a few days ago and said, Dad, Dad, there's a noise in the kitchen. And I said, oh, okay. And, you know, I trust the Lord, you know, but as an American, I have the right to bear arms, so I, I don't know which one to go with or go, go for, and I don't know what it was. We just moved there a year ago, so it was a fridge, the ice makers acting up. And so having gone through all that, we're here today. Because of the Lord, we're here today. He carries us through. We may only make it to this line right here in all our effort to do right and to move forward. We may only make it to here. And then he wants us over there. And so what do you think is between here and there? What's in between here that gets us from there to there? Grace. The unmerited favor of God. Jesus' attitude is, you give me your best, and when you've done your best and can't do no more, I'll do the rest. And I'll get you where you're supposed to be. Amen? Sister Jen, your verse, please. 
Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. You may look to your left, you may look to your right, and you always keep moving forward, but you never go backwards. In fact, it's even dangerous to stand in neutral. Because an idle mind is the enemy's playground, right? But forward is the one speed that God has. Always moving forward. When you're distracted in your everyday living, in your life, your circumstance, you didn't expect a situation, you didn't expect, you, don't turn from that. Don't, don't turn from the course. Stay the course and trust God. Try him. Trust God. You said that if I continue to serve you, I will run and not grow weary. I will walk and not faint. Matter of fact, you said I will mount up with wings as eagle and fly over all these circumstances and situations just to get to where you want me to get to no matter what I have to go through. I will not get stuck. He will be with you in trouble. That's what he said in the scripture in the Psalms. He says he is, he is the very present help in trouble. So when trouble comes to your life, look for Jesus because he's there. If it's not, he'd be a liar. He is not a man that he should lie, nor a liar that he should repent. He said he'll be there in the midst of trouble. When you don't have the answers, I, I turn to him. I have been, I'm, be, I'm beginning to learn how to pray, not just when circumstances hit our lives, but for any little thing. Because if you practice praying about any little thing, you'll be sure to pray for those big things that hit you. Trust him. Focus on him. Stay the course so that when we cross that finish line, we can see each other Again. Sister, please. <clears throat> Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders, and that's the sin that's so easily entangled, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. <clears throat> You train with some people, like I train with Brother Chris, but you can never expect to go shoulder to shoulder throughout the whole race, especially when it's a long one. But you focus, again, that, I can't get away from that word. And you look towards the prize. He is the author and finisher of our faith. So whatever he started in us, he's going to finish it. Even if at times we don't know what's going on, we trust in him and he'll go ahead and GPS us back to where we're supposed to be. He'll hit that recenter button. I don't know if the guys use the GPS. We use it all the time. And he recenters us. That's what he does. He doesn't meet a beat. He doesn't miss a beat. He's on point with everything. Everything. And when he promised something, he's going to fulfill it. You can bank on it. You can bank on it. As long as we don't get offended by, of, of, of the things that he does. In other words, like with John. John went into jail, right? And uh, John the Baptist, and he told one of the guys, said, listen, ask him, is he the one, or should we wait on another one? And later on in those scriptures, it says, blessed, you tell him, blessed is he, First, he told him, let him know that the ministry is going on. People are getting saved, healed. They're getting their sight back. They're getting resurrected. So the ministry is going on. The power is still on the move here. But you just tell him that I said, blessed are those that are not offended in me. He was offended because here's John the Baptist who walked with Jesus, baptized Jesus, right? And he did a lot of things with Jesus. Now he's in jail. And if you read the scripture, Jesus never went to visit him. So he was offended. And he knew he'll catch his attention when he sent this guy to tell Jesus, I believe it was Timothy, he told him, he said, tell him, ask him, is he the one or am I supposed to wait on another one? 
And Jesus is like, he knows I'm the one. <laughs> he was there when the dove came down. He was there when my father talked. He was the one that baptized me. He knows I'm the one. You go, oh, he's offended because I haven't gone to see him since he got locked up because of me. I haven't gone to see him. So he was offended is what it was. So if we don't get offended in the things of the Lord, then you can expect the Lord always to come to our offense or def defense in everything we go through and in everything we face. Amen? Do we have one more scripture? Brother Randy? I'm going to give a little context here. This is in the last chapter of Daniel. Amen. Daniel was taken away into exile by the Babylonians. He grew up in that regime. The legal persons came over and took over. He continued to be faithful to God. We all know about Daniel and Elias and God's faithfulness to Daniel. And now Daniel's receiving a lot of information here. So starting in verse 8, at the end of the chapter, chapter 12, he says, I heard but I didn't understand, so I asked, My Lord, what will be the outcome of all of this? God replied, and Go your way, Daniel. Because the words are closed up and sealed until the time for them. Many will be purified, made spotless, and refined, but the wicked will continue to be the wicked. None of the wicked will understand, but those who are wise will understand. From the time that the, da the daily sacrifice is abolished and the abomination that causes desolation is set up, there will be 1,290 days. Blessed is the one who waits for and reaches the end of 1,000. 335 days. As for you, go your way to the end. You will rest, and then at the end of the days, you will receive your allotted inheritance. Amen. Thank you, brother. Appreciate that. When he we say that one sleeps in the Lord and is resting. They're resting from the works they did for the Lord while we was here. When we stay the course, when we feel like it or don't feel like it, uh, when we read in the times that we feel like reading or we don't feel like reading, when we pray, same thing, when we feel like praying or we don't feel like praying, we're staying the course. No matter what the cost, what, what it costs us to do this, it is not to be compared to the price that Jesus paid for us. And in that, he's telling us the time of rest will come. Right now, I need you to stay busy. I need you to keep the course. There are people out there that need to know who I am. In all these years, in all their lives, they haven't received me as their Lord and Savior. You will rest. You will have plenty of time to rest and enjoy yourself in your eternal life. Keep the course. Keep spreading the gospel. Keep sharing the good news. Reach as many people as you can. Make peace with all who you can make peace with. Because there are families today, and this is shameful, that know the gospel. They got family members, and they don't go over there because of some little thing that happened years ago. And the scripture tells us that when it's in our power to, uh, to, to keep the peace, then we should make the peace. And we should be able to put that to the side, break through that, and reach the family member, reach that soul. Win them for the Lord, or at least give them the opportunity to win them for the Lord, for them to come to Christ. And you set yourself free from that responsibility. But God forbid they pass on. And you had the medicine to give to them. You had the good news to share with them. And you didn't do it. Now you're going to have to give account for that. Don't let nothing stand in your way. From, from when you're on this course. Reach all those that God brings before you. Reach out to those that you know. Uh, don't know the Lord. And you have time to do it. Whether it be by phone. By mail. By, by a personal uh, visit. Do it. Dude, don't get so caught up in the worldly things, that, you know, the, the, the job and this and that, and, and they just spend five, six minutes for the Lord. It should be more like the other way around. We have to do this. And he said that he promises we will have time to rest. 
He knows where we're at. He knows where we stand. He knows where we're headed. He knows everything that's happening. He knows that. Sometimes the Lord, can you see what's going on here? Yes. Yes. But we have to hold on there, no matter what. I know it's tougher for some than for others, but you have to find a way to hold on and trust God. When you feel like you've reached your end, you have to trust God. It is not the end. Hold on and trust God and let him lead you to the next stage, to the next station, to the next level. Amen? Let me read one more verse for you. This is 2 Timothy. This is Paul encouraging Timothy. There's a lot of um, uh, miscommunication, a lot of uh, fables, a lot of um, um, they have taken the doctrine and they have twisted it to, you know, sweeten it up so they can, you know, feed those who have itchy ears, you know, and just bring them in. And we're living that time. Not every evangelist or preacher you see on TV is doing it for the Lord. I don't care what anybody says, and I'm telling you the truth. You got to watch who you listen to. You got to watch who you receive an encouragement from. And you have to confirm. Confirm the scriptures. Confirm the message. If you leave here with a doubt, take the scriptures, go read it at the house for yourself. Ask the Lord to open up your knowledge and, and, and read it. So you, oh yeah, he was on point. I said, oh no, brother Pastor Martin was dead wrong. You, you know what I'm saying? And the next time you see me, you correct me in the word with love. Okay? Let me close out with this. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 6 and 8. For I am already being poured out as a drink offering. And the time of my departure is at hand. I have, I have done everything that I could. I've been rinsed out of everything I've knowledge and everything that I've had to offer. I've put it out there. And now it's getting close to my departure. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. And I know that she did because even in her some of the conditions that she was going through, she was still talking about God. When we went to visit her, I said this at the, at the wake, when we went to visit her in the hospital, we go prepared. We go praying. We go ready to minister. And when she turns around in her hospital bed and ministers to us, that means she wasn't through. She wasn't focused on her sickness. She was focused, focused on God's work. She stayed the course until the end. And she said, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Finally, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, in the other Bible says, which the Lord himself the righteous judge will give to me on that day. And not, here, here's the promise. And not to me only, but also to all who have loved his appearing. We will see her again. Amen. Not because I say it, because the scripture says it. We have all those people here whose who's mom and dad, sisters and brothers have left, and, and we pray that they've left with the Lord. Only you guys know them, and, and, and they knew that. And if you stay the course, and you do, the Paul, Paul said, imitate me in Christ. Don't do everything I do, per se, but everything you know that I'm doing in Christ, that do. Because that's going to get you in. That's going to help you finish the course. That's going to get you across that finish line. And then us that have already family members, remember I said about the race, think spiritually, that they're already waiting for us at the finish line? Those are those that went ahead ahead of us. If we really miss them, because sometimes, I'm going to tell you something, sometimes I go to the funeral and they oh, I miss them. Nobody's, there's no tears, there's no cry. I don't understand how you can tell me you love somebody and you're going to miss them so much and you don't shed one tear. I've always had a problem. And some, even my wife said, 
Well, people mourn differently. Yeah, well, I don't, I don't know about that. <laughs> if I'm going to miss Brother John, or John's gonna, Brother John's gonna miss me. <laughs> I hope and pray that in the celebration of my departure, because it is a celebration, it is a graduation. That's why we shouldn't mourn like we don't have hope or like they didn't have no hope. We have hope. She had the hope of going to Jesus and live eternally. Amen? So I expect some sort of emotion. And I told my wife, I said, I want music. I want preaching. I want people to say good things. I said, don't, t- don't, don't bring flowers. You didn't bring me the flowers when I was alive. Ain't no sense in bringing me the flowers now. You know, you understand, most of the time that happens a lot. They bring you flowers after you're gone. You can't enjoy them. You know what I'm saying? No, 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 no flowers. I'm being that serious. I'm being that serious. You can record it if you want. And, and, and then just keep a section over there for those that, that, that may be mourning without hope because they're the ones that are going to be crying. Go ahead. That, but I, I say, listen, in, during the wake, I say, cry. Because you're going to miss the person. No more high fives, no more hugs here on earth. You're going to miss their cooking. You're going to miss their advice. You're going to miss their laughter. You're going to miss their visit. So that has to build something in you and shed, and shed a tear or two. But don't mourn like she's in a worse place because I said it before and I'll say it again. If the Lord came to Sister Catherine now and said, listen, daughter of mine, come. I want to, I want to just let you know that your family is down there. And they're crying. And they're missing you, and some, you know, just wish that you had not gone. Do you want to go back? You know what she's going to say? She's going to say, and I'm going to be honest, she's going to say, Lord, I love my family, and I love my friends. Even those that owe me money. (laughs) But I'm not going back down there. Not after having seen all that you have for me here. I'm not going back down there. And excuse the expression to that dirty world. They're just going to have to keep the course. And then they can come up here. And once they get here, they're not going to want to go back. That's what she would say. She loves you. She misses you just as much as we miss her. But she's not coming back. She's at rest with the Lord. And when those trumpets blow, right, those that are passed on will, 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 will rise up first. The others that are believers will meet, up, meet them in the air to be meet with the Lord in the air and to be with Jesus Christ and God forever and ever and ever and ever. That is the promise of the Lord Jesus Christ himself. And so if we keep the course, no matter if you see me again or I don't see you again, I know that either you'll be waiting for me at the finish line or I'm going to be waiting for you at the finish line. Like John said, let it be the other way around. (laughs) I love you guys. I appreciate you guys. McCony family, It's good to see you here. It's good to see you strong in the Lord, trusting, believing. Hold on to those wonderful memories, wonderful thoughts, all those teachings of mama, because that's what's going to pull you through in weak moments. And we're going to have weak moments. Okay? But hold on to that. That's the anchor. The memories that are left to us of our loved ones, once they leave, become treasure to us becomes strength to us. And that's what helps, helps us get through it all. Amen? Amen? Love you guys. Appreciate that. Uh, the opportunity to be here. And uh, we're going to go ahead and uh, have the communion. Okay? There is a scripture I'll read with that. Uh, 
First Corinthians chapter 11. I want you to listen to the scripture because it's very important. All right, it's very important. I got an NIV version, which is good because it, it kind of a uh, little more plain English. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23, beginning of verse 23. For I received from the Lord that, that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. We were not there when he was crucified, tortured, mistreated, whipped, nailed to the cross, and we weren't there for that. But when we do the communion, it symbolizes spiritually, it puts us over there during that time. He says, do this in remembrance of me on everything that I went through for you and for me. This is what we have to have in our mind and in our heart when we partake of the communion. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes again. Therefore, whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But it doesn't stop there. It gives us the opportunity to examine ourselves. And when, when I say examine ourselves, that means while you're sitting there, you bring everything to the Lord that you think may need forgiveness. Everything. You don't want to participate. And I'm not trying to scare anybody from participating in the communion. But I also don't want to be responsible for anything that takes place before the Lord because I didn't read his scriptures. I read it, you take it to heart, and you react to it as you see fit, okay? It says here, but let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself, not taking the time to discern the Lord's body, not taking into consideration everything that he did for us, the significance, the meaning of partaking in the communion. You're just taking it to take it and then you're going home. No, you don't want to do that. You want to examine yourself and the Lord search me. If there's anything in me that makes me unworthy, get it out. If you remember what it was, bring it before his presence in your prayers, right, in a whispered prayer. If you don't remember, just say, search me, Lord. Search me, because Scripture says in Psalms 139, he knows where we are. He knows where we stand. And finally, for he who drinks and eats, this, eats and drinks in an unworthy manner, eats and drinks in judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this reason, many are weak and sick among you, and many sleep. That's the scripture, that's the word of the Lord. Let's take a moment, close our eyes, bow our heads, and examine ourselves. Search our hearts.
And if there's anything there you got to give to the Lord, give it before you come and participate in the communion. I'm not saying this. This is what the scripture, these are the instructions of the scriptures. Every eye closed, every head bow, examine ourselves. Thank you, Lord. Let's have those brothers and sisters that are going to participate in the... Uh